Ladies and gentlemen, um, dear friends, good to see you all. Welcome to Fallesus, our common Nordic house here in Berlin. As you, I hope most of you have already seen the exhibition. Um, and I mean, most, most of you in the room are familiar with the topic, but for many, uh, heavy metal from the north was still a secret. And so this, exhibi or this uh, exhibition opens up people's eyes, it shows a new, uh, something new from the Nordic countries, and it's really been popular. We got a lot of uh, visitors here to Fallesus. But it's also, um, you all, I mean, you all know Berlin, so I'm not going to describe the scene here. And, and you know, you, when you, for those of you who have not seen the exhibition, you will get a bit of taste how also with the concert we have tonight and also the, the seminar and, and also, uh, as I said, the exhibition, you get a glimpse of what we have to offer from the Nordian, Nordic countries. But uh, for us, it's also who are living here in Germany, you know, we are really, um, we really, uh, we really admire how many metal fans there actually are, and uh, how many also visit Germany. And uh, I just want to take an example. Uh, the president from Iceland, my country, he visited uh, Wacken Festival, and he's a great fan. And uh, he he had really had a great time. I know. Even though he, ju he, he though arrived, he, he, he wore his uh, boots, but it wasn't rainy. It was just very muddy when he arrived. <laughs> but at, that, uh, semi at the uh, festival, he participated in a podium and uh, discussed a bit about, I mean, he, he was explaining a bit uh, heavy metal from his standpoint or point of view. And uh, what I really like what he said is that, uh, that the importance of heavy metal uh, how it links to our Nordic culture heritage, and how through uh, heavy metal it is passed on to new generations and groups. And this is so important in the digital age today. Um, and uh, as I said, this exhibition has broken all records. We have had a lot of guests and a lot of events, and I would like to thank everyone that has participated in everyone, every, every uh, all the events. And we will have uh, Tomorrow or after this uh, event here tonight, we will also have a Nordic podcast, which will be accessible uh, after, yeah, after this event tonight. Uh, but I would especially like to congratulate and thank Ika. Um, I'm just going to have this very Nordic. I'm just going to go on first name basis here. Thank you so much for everything and the co curators also Torgrim and Silja, thank you for your excellent work and cooperation. It's really been, and please give them a great applause because it's really been. <laughs> and also thank the Nordic Council of Ministers because without their support, we would not have had this exhibition. Um, but uh, we decided to have uh, tonight's uh, event, which is the end of the exhibition, uh, we will discuss the outlook on the future and, uh, of, uh, and invited a few professionals to discuss this topic um, and uh, on the heavy metal, what this future will be. And uh, we don't have much, well, it's not a long, but hopefully you will you know, learn as much as, uh, as possible here tonight. And, and, and I'm looking forward to fruitful discussions also. But I would like to also thank the speakers and thank you for coming and participating. Uh, and also, uh, you, you don't have uh, an exhibition on heavy metal without music. And I know that many are you, of you are waiting for the concert here tonight with Sylvain. Many of you have come also to see her. And thank you so much for, for coming. Uh, but before the music starts, just some practical issues. Um, after the concert, we will have a 15 minute break just to rebuild here everything, the stage for the discussions. And uh, after the discussions, uh, there will be some opportunity for uh, to exchange ideas and on the exhibition floor here upstairs. And the coffee bar in the in here, the house will be open until 9, 9 p.m. tonight. But before I give the floor to Ika Torki Masilia, I just wanted to read something that is uh, also is one of my favorites. Uh, it's actually, I'm not going to say that I'm going to read in Old Norse, but Icelandic is actually the oldest, you know, it's closest to the Old Norse. 
but it's from um, it's a short text from the song Kvalning or the call by the group Skalmult. And this, when you read it, I'm not going to try. It, it really refers to our Nordic heritage. And um, but you can see all of this upstairs. I'm just going. I mean, we have excellent information from all the Nordic countries. And as I say, please look at the exhibition. But um, this, uh, when I read this, I just think of yeah our Nordic heritage and our Nordic. Um, so it sounds like this in Icelandic or, or Old Norse. Ef núna hef ég verk að vinna, vega blóka stinga og flá, höldu nú á feigðarinnar fund, þetta ferðalag mun telja okkar daga. Vaskir menn á vígmóðri stund og valhöll býður okkar, höldum nú á feigðarinnar fund, þetta ferðalag er köllun vor og saga. And I'll just say, long live heavy metal. I wish you all a great evening. So. <laughs> dear Nordic embassies, dear artists, curators, and dear guests, it is my pleasure to address you tonight for the closing of the exhibition Der Harte Norden Heavy Metal aus den Nordischen Ländern. A lot of people are calling Berlin their Valheim, their adopted home. One of the many reasons for this might be its open arms to all forms of backgrounds and lifestyles. And we are proud to call us home to a wider variety of the so-called subcultures. It is this very open mind that provides Berliners and visitors alike with a unique culture experience and elevates the city of Berlin to one of the world's cultural hotspots. The exhibition and its framework program on heavy metal from the Nordic countries clearly demonstrates that no one should underestimate the creative and economic potential lying in subcultures. What was once an underground phenomenon born in teenagers' rooms has now become a gigantic industry for me, a quite familiar one. Today, extreme metal bands are welcomed into the most respected cultural institutions and are awarded prizes by governments. Extreme metal is not meant to be easy to digest. This music is not seldom challenging what we think of as artistic freedom. Yet, it is this very artistic freedom that Nordic countries are known for. And it is this very freedom that challenges us and contributes to not only new perspectives, but also a growing understanding for each other and a peaceful coexistence. Denmark, Finland, Iceland, Norway, and Sweden are known for innovation, openness, and a willingness to experiment. What better place to share these values and your passion for metal than Berlin? I wish you the best of luck with tonight's panel on the future of metal and hope that it will generate future opportunities for exchange between your countries and the city of Berlin. Thank you very much. Have fun. Hello, metalheads. <laughs> My name is Ike Johansson, and this is Silje Vergeland and Torgrim Öyre. <laughs> yes, please. Please. Thank you so much for coming. The whole summer, people have been coming and looking at this exhibition that we you know, did as best as we could and wanted to create like the best exhibition ever. And as I understand, there have been over a good bit over 20,000 visitors this summer, which makes this a record for Felicis, which is pretty cool. And as, um, as always, when you speak to people, I work as a music journalist, and always when you speak to people about um, metal and um, people outside of metal. I mean, for me, I'm not really surprised that that many people came at all, because people do come, because the interest and the love for this genre is so deep and it's so wide, and it's quite confounding for people outside of the genre why, it's so, uh, why it means so much to people. And I've experienced this many times in, uh, in different areas, and my... Um, when I got this, uh, the question, do you want to, to make an exhibition on uh, Nordic metal? It was such a dream. I mean, I, did, I had to pinch myself. I'm like, are you joking? <laughs> Can I call people from all the bands and say, do you have that thing? Do you have that thing? They're like, yes. Like, okay. And in the package, 
I got silly and told him as well, as experts on the Nordic and uh, the Norwegian uh, genre. So, our idea and the like main idea of the entire exhibition is to show the development from the teenage room. I grew up outside of Gothenburg in the suburbs at the end of the 80s and my friends were the people that became Dark Tranquility in Flames at the gates, Hammerfall. I grew up with them, we tape traded, we didn't get into any clubs, we drank beers in playgrounds listening to demos from Brazil on boomboxes. It was amazing. No one knew what we were doing. It felt like we had a secret. I can now understand all those old punks in all the documentaries that, you know, look back on the olden days, like everything was better then. And sometimes I can like, yes, the playground. <laughs> Take me back. But from then, from the late 80s until now, the arch of metal has been crazy. We are now standing in an embassy where we are exhibiting coffins and spikes <laughs> and weapons, which I do te will tell you it was a big problem to get into this country <laughs> from outside of the EU. And it needs to go back out. It also needs well. to go back out. <laughs> and uh, we could write a book about the making of this. So that's, that's the story we wanted to tell. And uh, we wanted to, um, of course, try to explain to people outside of metal why this means so much to us. Um, the connections with history, with uh, mythology, with, to classical music, to the folk tales, to poetry of the Nordics. Um, I remember coming here and explaining my idea and I was talking about, you know, going into basements, listening to black metal, having blood thrown at you. And the people here were like, well, you don't do that, do you? <laughs> like, well, yes, I do. But you guys go to Wagner and it's almost the same thing. It's the same power. You go to Bayreuth and it's the power and what it does to you is very similar. So, but of course, also we wanted to, to uh, explain the genre and the power of this genre and the community and the love we all share for this and what it means to us but also to hide jewels for the fans. And I really hope, and I was very helped by this uh, from Silja and Togrim, uh, to find the collector's items. So can you please tell us a bit about that? Well, we can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, I don't think we would have managed to do this without this gentleman sitting over there, Finn Hawk on Rödlan, who has a massive uh, collection of uh, items from the, especially in the Norwegian black metal mm. scene. So I think you all should give him a big hand <laughs> with a lot. <laughs> and of course, a lot of other bands, uh, not other bands, <laughs> not other band, but uh, bands from, from, from all, all the, yeah, yeah, like yeah, for yeah. example, Enslaved. Yes. Re represented. There's a Eva. side drop. Yeah. And I still can't believe that I managed, that we actually have the denim jacket belonging to Necro Butcher of Mayhem, which he wore on the photos from the Langhus bus station. And you who know, you know. And the others will think, yeah, that's a denim jacket. <laughs> and that's fine. <laughs> and we also have the backstage pass for the Live in Leipzig gig, the original pass. Again, you who know, you know. <laughs> so we wanted to do an, an open, and inviting an explanatory exhibition, but also with gifts for you all. And thank you so much for coming. And now we're gonna listen to some really great music curated by Toge Mesilje. Do you want yeah. to present <laughs> <laughs> Sylvain? Uh, yeah. present yeah. I don't know if you, you probably have heard of Sylvain. Um, beautiful uh, music. She's going to do a uh, half acoustic uh, version tonight since we are here. <laughs> uh, but it's going to be beautiful, so uh, we hope you enjoy it. Uh, yeah, and see you around later. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you to the embassies for also having, yeah. wait a minute, for also having the courage to do this. Because it hasn't been easy. Um, metal is, uh, a big part of metal is to provoke. It has to do with the dark sides and subjects that can be hard to digest and imagery that can be hard to digest. So I think it's very courageous for the embassies to, to give this this spotlight. 
And uh, thank you for that. And uh, yes, and thank also, you. <laughs> and also thank you, Ika, because you've been a dream to work with. You've done an excellent job. Thank you. I think she deserves a big, big <laughs> hand. Yeah. It's up to us. Yes, okay. So uh, welcome again and thanks everybody for coming out in such great numbers. Um, tonight we're going to lay to rest this great exhibition that was enjoyed by, uh, like I heard, around 20,000 people over the past uh, few months. And it was uh, an exhibition that mainly put a light uh, on the glorious past of Scandinavian metal. But now we're going we want to see uh, where it all leads to and we want to discuss how metal will look in the future and where this scene is going. And to discuss this topic, we have a brilliant choice of experts here on the panel to do so. <laughs> so as there are, uh, you saw and heard her before, it's Catherine Shepard, known under her stage name Sylvain, award-winning Norwegian metal innovator and uh, welcome here on the panel. Great to have you here. Thank you. Then we have Finn Håkon Rødland, black metal expert, and he owns uh, what is called the most important black metal collection in the world. He contributed a lot of his devotionals to this exhibition that you can see outside. And you can follow him on Instagram like thousands of others do where he goes by the name The True Mayhem Collection, and there you can get inside of his collection. Welcome, Finn. Thank you. <laughs> then we have Torgrim Eure. He's the director of the annual, annual metal festival Beyond the Gates in the, in the city of Bergen, which gets attention from all over the world, and he is co-curator of the exhibition. <laughs> and and then, uh, then we have Ika Johannesson. Uh, she is what I would say the mother of this exhibition. She has curated it with a lot of passion <laughs> and supreme knowledge. And um, besides, she is a renowned Swedish music journalist and uh, the author of the Swedish metal history book, Blood, Fire, Death, uh, what it is called in Norwegian. <laughs> yeah. yeah, Ika. Give it up for Ika. <laughs> and then, of course, we have the legend Eva Bjornsson here, the founder, guitarist, and main composer of the Norwegian progressive metal giants Enslaved, who recently released their 16th record, Heimdall, which hit the German charts at position 26. <laughs> Eva. <laughs> So, um, we're going to talk about the future of metal today, but there is no future without a past, as we all know, and it seems that the past is becoming more and more important in metal, because uh, on the covers of the magazines there are often records that are 30 or 40 years old, and the festivals advertise shows uh, with bands who play old albums in their entirety, and there has even been uh, a record by the Swedish metal band Enforcer called Nostalgia. Can I uh, say the past is alive? Yeah, <laughs> it seems like the past is alive, but um, is metal too much focused on its, uh, on its heritage? What, what do you think, uh, Finn, as a keeper of the heritage? I think we are a group of people now in you know 40s 50s we are getting old and wow. <laughs> not her <laughs> <laughs> you you are the contrary uh, not old uh, but you know group of people having been some people have been part of this environment from the beginning and you have bands that have you know kept it going for 30 years and they are you know also getting old and you can't expect them to do innovative, fantastic albums anymore when they are in the 50s. <laughs> but uh, and I think there are, you know, to be honest, I think they should be allowed to, you know, uh, to, to be allowed to celebrate their past because they have made so many 
fantastic albums in the 90s. And, you know, for, for fans like us, we, we would love to see, you know, their the old bands performing the classical albums they made in the 90s. So I don't see any, anything wrong about it. Uh, I think they deserve to do it. Of course, if, if, if it can be a balance that they could do both, you know, you know, celebrating the past, but also, you know, continuing to try to develop and do new music, that, that would be the optimal. Uh, so when you look at, for example, you know, Beyond the Gates, they are, you know, combining old and new, uh, you know, bringing nostalgia I in, you know, uh, to the stage, but also bringing in the new guys, doing the, the you know, the, the new music that we would also like to listen to. So having both, I think, is, is the good, good, good way of uh, approaching it. But isn't Eva the best example for someone who's still doing innovative albums, uh, even e if he's reached 40 years now? <laughs> 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 so uh, I would say, um, Torgrim, yeah. when you put together a festival lineup, how do you keep the balance of the past and the future? I mean, uh, both of... Uh the past and the future is equally important uh, because uh, you need, you know, the history, the legacy, the big names to sort of get the attention and reel in the big crowds. But then again, you need the new bands to create some sort of propose and the identity uh, for the festival because, I mean, uh, operating in a genre like metal, there's a lot of hardcore followers and they are, you know, are not only nostalgic. They are mm -hmm. also looking for n new, exciting bands. And uh, they are uh, also the people that speak the loudest. And, uh, and uh, that sort of, you know, people listen to them. And uh, if you manage to, you know, find the right kind of, of uh, uh, find the right new bands, that's always contributing to giving your festival an identity and uh, you speak, it, it tells you who you want to speak to and wh who, what kind of crowds you want to associate with. So if you, if you only have old bands and nostalgia, you end up like a mausoleum, but you mm -hmm. also uh, want to be a breathing uh, progressive uh, entity that you know, looks ahead and creates excitement and around the genre. And uh, what do you think of the idea of holograms replacing legendary artists <laughs> under, <laughs> under which circumstances would you book a virtual Ronnie James deal? That's not going to happen, I can it's promise you. It's not going to yeah, happen. Yeah. <laughs> okay. But it is interesting, to, I mean, s every, every year when, uh, when Sweden's biggest metal festival, Sweden Rock Festival, releases their, you know, the schedule for the summer, I mean, I always laugh. Because it's always Guns N' Roses, Death mm -hmm. Def Leppard, Motley Crue, again. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> I mean, this is not only extreme metal, of course, but, mm -hmm. but metal in general. And, and it, it just goes on. But I find also, I mean, metal is a pretty conservative genre, I would say, at least in, those cir in the circles I run. And a lot of the new bands coming sound a lot like the old mm -hmm. bands, too. And sometimes also, when you look at when when metal has been taken into new territories it's also been ridiculed you know we have the rap metal we have i mean we, there are like i would say that in sweden at least i it is pretty conservative so i think it's also hard to develop metal into new areas without it being shunned i don't do you agree at all how how do you um how do you experience that like in norway for example well, we could talk about Eva if you. Yeah, like let's <laughs> only talk about Eva. <laughs> but I, I mean, uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, as I mean, okay. Yeah. As but I mean, oh, yes, sorry, sorry uh, if I'm gonna ask you, answer your question. Uh, they are both a heritage act, but also a, a band that is very focused on taking the genre to new levels, and uh, they've played hundreds of times. Uh, at our festival, but they never do the same show. They can do new stuff. They can do old stuff with a new spin on it. So it's basically ways to you know re rediscovering in the past as well, I mean, not just you know going by the motion and uh, do things by the book. But Enslaved has done uh, their classic albums, but managed to add a new value to them mm -hmm. and uh, approach them differently 
to make it new and exciting and current. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that was the answer to your question or just Not me. Not really, but it was okay. <laughs> <laughs> but Propping Eva. But, but <laughs> like Catherine and Eva, both of you are like expanding the limits of metal more and more over the years. Uh, but no matter how experimental you get, you are still completely accepted by the metal community. And you just said that uh, the metal scene is very conservative, but isn't that the disapproval of that? Because um, maybe they are more open-minded uh, than their image. What are your experiences? Did, uh, did you get any backlashes when you get too experimental, when you incorporate too much crowd rock or something? Catherine? Okay, fine. <laughs> uh, for absolutely, yeah, for sure. I mean, uh, in my case, because um, as I was just saying earlier today during an interview, I actually never said that Sylvain was a metal band. I never put that, well, I didn't really put a genre tag on it anyways, but I never actually um, specified that I believe that this band is a black metal project or a metal project in any sorts. Um, so I think that helped me not being as criticized, uh, but definitely the mixture and having a more like pop side of the project and a more kind of uh, digestible side, I guess, is more melodic, more atmospheric. Most people seem to accept it, but there's definitely like the the core that's like not really not really into it. But in general, I do think that also metal is merging with a lot of different impulses these days. So I think it is expanding as well. You'll always have that core of like, you know, th the old bands are the best, those classic records are the best. But for me at least, it's maybe a conservative scene, but it's being forced to open up to new impulses from folk music, from electronic music, from all kinds of genres actually. Mm -hmm. And it's merging, just like art in general these days seems to be merging a lot with different kind of opposite expressions. But would you say your audience is mainly a metal audience? I think so, mm -hmm. yes. Uh, been very much embraced by the metal audience, which I believe is partially because I do, of course, use uh, metal, like if you want to call it tools in my music. So it automatically speaks to these people because they already understand and have an appreciation for it. Whereas if you're trying to show um, a 12 minute song that has screaming vocals and blast beats to a kind of pop fan, it might be a little harder. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but yeah, definitely, I feel very uh, appreciative that the metal scene, for some reason, or maybe clear reasons, have embraced the project, even if it's not typically in the mainstream version of metal, if you can say that. Mm -hmm. And Eva, have you ever, ever told by anybody this time you took it too far? Oh, so many times. <laughs> <laughs> and what did you answer? Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Goodbye. Thank you. That's perfect. Love it. Mm -hmm. See you later. Enjoy your life. <laughs> and so on. And um, I think many, especially Scandinavian artists like Ghost or Mirkur or Isan or most of all Ulva, they, they stray very far from what is commonly considered as metal. Yet, they are conceived somehow in a metal context. And what is it that makes an artist metal? It must be more than the music, I think. It's a spiritual idea. I'm going to go out on a limb and say it's a um, spiritual thing. We have the same with uh, the record label I work in, uh, My Norse Music. So we have this thing that we call all, all our artists Nordic. Well, then you have an electronic artist from Asia. How Nordic is that? It doesn't matter. We think it's Nordic. <laughs> For us, it's something we like. And I guess it's the same with metal. I, d I do it at home. I have two uh, small daughters, nine and 12. The oldest one is a ballet dancer. Uh, the nine-year-old uh, goes to circus practice. And I keep going like, that's so metal. And to begin with, they were like, hmm, and now they're getting it. So they get it. When I say, that's so metal, they understand it's great. It's inclusive. It has to do with ability. And that's what I, com that's what I associate with metal is from the scene, you know, when we were 15 people in Haugesund. A shitty offense. 
city in, uh, on the west coast of Norway. And we met at the record store on Saturday and I saw, hey, there's a new Bathory album, all that stuff. It was about you're playing in a band, you're running a fan thing, will be the old school version of you. Um, not exactly hanging out at embassies. <laughs> <laughs> But the whole, like, the measurement, it, it, it's always been, you know, you have the pop scene, the popular kids. And that's about being popular or being sexy or what the fuck, you know. Black metal was, didn't have anything to do with being sexy until, not to mention any names, but it happens in, happened in the 90s. <laughs> and that's when it started to die. <laughs> and it's dead now. But it was about, like, how much did you involve yourself in the scene? If you were a listener, a tape trader, a musician, a good one, a really bad one, <laughs> didn't matter. If you were involved, if you were dedicated, you were accepted into the scene. Didn't have anything to do with like how cool you looked or like how, how many back patches you could afford or what the fuck, you know? It was like, you tried, and then we were a member of the scene. And now I have no idea what the question was, so. <laughs> 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 Let's leave it there. I think, I think maybe I, I see what you were getting at, because all the bands that you mentioned, artists, um, I think that within the metal scene, you recognize this. You recognize the dedication, you recognize the love, and even though what Ghost does today, musically, is very far from what Tobias Forge have do has done before within the metal scene. He still has the references mm -hmm. to early, mm -hmm. like Merciful for Fate. You can mm -hmm. see, as a metalhead, you can see the references. You know who he is. Mm -hmm. And then, I mean, it, God knows, loads of people hate Ghost, mm -hmm. the, you know, and Myrker also, because she... You know, mm -hmm. anyone that pushes the boundaries will mm -hmm. get hate. Mm -hmm. But, but as to answer your question, you you s you see the roots, mm -hmm. um, in a way that people, you know, the drunk guys at ghost shows I've met in the states, they don't care, mm -hmm. but we care. So mm -hmm. it's just two, two different angles on it, and it's it's interesting in another way. Then, so I think it, yeah, you can you can see it, and you feel some sort of uh, camaraderie or community with that person. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yep. Well, welcome. And I can give uh, I can give one example. To because if you look uh, if you look at Satyricon, um, mm -hmm. I would say that uh, you know the Satyricon and the Monk album that mm -hmm. he made. For me, that's more black metal than everything he did the last twenty years. I, I know people don't agree, but that for me, it's a black metal album, Norwegian black metal. If you listen to it, because of the feel, mm -hmm. feel about it. So I don't I don't believe in the rules that you have. Uh, I think it's more about the feeling and, you know, how we experience it. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, let's... The least sexy album has done. <laughs> and it's that's not good. sexy. And that's good. Yes. Mm. And it's demanding. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and sexy. Very <laughs> unsexy. <laughs> and uh, I think the biggest problem that we are facing in the metal scene is the uh, retirement of Iron Maiden that will come at <laughs> some day, <laughs> at some day, and... Um, Let them uh, die. <laughs> and Torgrim, I think you are one of the biggest <laughs> Iron Maiden fans on earth. Yeah. Don't cry, Torgrim. And <laughs> who do you think, will there ever be a metal band again that, like Iron Maiden, that everybody can agree upon, and who will fill this vacuum, vacuum that they're leaving? I just need to point out that I'm wearing a Metallica shirt yeah, for I the first time today, <laughs> just to be unpredictable. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, I have no idea. It's really difficult, but uh, I don't think that we will ever experience bands like Black Sabbath or Maiden or Metallica or whatever ever again, because you don't have the same type of uh, attention span. You don't have the same uh, time for myth building or whatever Th there's too much information people are too restless to uh, sort of cultivate that kind of culture and uh, <laughs> dedication yeah yeah no, no. <laughs> <Please finish. laughs> 
Yeah, I, I mean, uh, I don't know. Uh, there's too much going on for uh, for people to like pay uh, invest in uh, in one single band uh, for such a long time to create mm. that sort of, mm. I mean, mythology or history or it's like yeah. Nowadays, uh, you ha have to show what kind of toilet paper you have on your bathroom to sort of gain attention in social media or whatever. And that's not <laughs> compatible with creating uh, escapism and big bands. Mm -hmm. And also today, sorry if you were going to say something, but, but today, when we grew up in the 80s, uh, late 70s, 80s, 90s, there were today you can show your identity and y there are so many alternatives. We didn't have that many alternatives. No. The people who didn't want to go up into the main, you know, who, who felt like an outsider. So today there are more opportunities to delve into different millions of subcultures that didn't exist before we started inventing them, <laughs> you know? Mm. So, um, so that, that also plays into it. I just want to mention uh, a conference where they had a topic. Uh, why don't they make classic cars anymore? It's fucking easy. It has to go a long time before they become classics. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, you can do an instant classic. No, not really. <laughs> so, <laughs> vintage music. Okay, let's meet in 30 years and I'm sure we can mm -hmm. yeah. agree that somebody came after me. Mm -hmm. No offense. But I, I think we are all somehow of the same age and we all grew up with Iron Maiden and Black <laughs> Sabbath, and uh, except, except for, yeah. yeah, that's what I wanted to say, except for uh, Catherine, who were, who were your heroes when you were even younger than you are now? I'm not very curious as to what age you are. <laughs> I don't know how old you are. I'm 32. Okay. So I'm not that young, actually. Yeah. I'm not but much younger that's not than, than, young. than us. <laughs> <laughs> but, but who were your... Uh, Iron Maiden, so your Metallica, so. Well, so we had Spice Girls and Backstreet Boys. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, for me, it was maybe more bands in the 90s, like, for example, Typo Negative was mm. a massive one for me, uh, at least. <laughs> but I also, I mean, because I'm basically like a hundred on the inside, I also really liked uh, all the more vintage bands, like Black Sabbath was a huge one for me as well. Mm -hmm. um, so I was already looking back, I guess, even uh, if, even though I'm not that young, but still, I was already looking back. <coughs> so, but yeah. Tell a Metallica story. <laughs> that uh, seems appropriate. Let's go. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, because yeah, I work in production, but I don't do metal because I want metal to be a hobby, and I have my work in the daytime. So okay, Metallica came to Bergen, and they tell us told us this great story uh, that in San Francisco they were doing this. Uh, baseball arena kind of show. They were invited by the Rolling Stones to be the opening band. <laughs> and they were like, ah, being a support band, that seems a bit odd. <laughs> but why the hell not? It's a good story for the grandchildren. So they say yes, and they go there, and uh, they're outside of the dressing room. They're all like restless. They're very teenage Metallica guys. And then this guy comes up and says, do you want to have your photo taken with the Rolling Stones? And they were like, uh, shit, does he know who we are? <laughs> yeah, sure. <laughs> and then they're all there. And then this guy comes out and he's like, stand there on the X. And they're, what, okay. And they're all huddling together. And then Rolling Stones comes out of their dressing room, walks past, stops for a second, take a photo. Mick Jagger goes, eh. Walks off. <laughs> <laughs> no, like, cool. <laughs> We're still teenagers, yeah. There's always somebody make it bigger. Yeah. <laughs> 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 but, um, yeah. <laughs> speaking of the future, I think uh, obviously the future of uh, listening to music might be streaming. Is that a good outlook on the future, Eva? Yeah, why the hell not? <laughs> we came from our first albums released on LPs, first and foremost, and the royalties were enormous. I'm not kidding. Our first album came out in uh, 
94, uh, and I uh, took my driver's license on my birthday as I turned 18. And then I used all the money from the first album, Viking Lake Valley, to buy a car. Woo! <laughs> <laughs> and now it would be like all the royalties from the album would be, yeah, some, what do you call it? Windows wishers? <laughs> 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 It changed. <laughs> it changed. But uh, who cares? You know, <laughs> we're not any for the money, obviously. <laughs> okay. And we won the when the the piracy thing happened with um, uh, Napster. Lime Naps Wire? Napster. Napster. Napster Lime Wire. Yeah. We're like skeptical, like mm, they're probably making some money off of the books. So some artists went like, oh, give the kids free music, that's fine. Los Ulrich was fucking right. There were some bastards behind here making a lot of money on fucking advertisement on the internet. Pirate Bay, boop. <laughs> so yeah, Los, I'm gonna be a Catholic for five seconds and say Los Ulrich should be sanctified. <laughs> 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 I'm done. <laughs> Satan again. <laughs> <laughs> Pirate Bay, all the good things coming out of Sweden. Yes. <laughs> um, but on the other hand, vinyl had a massive com comeback over the recent years, uh, especially in the metal scene. And uh, Catherine, what would you say, how is the division of your record sales, which, uh, which is the most important medium for you? Do you sell more uh, on vinyl or CD or streams? or? I mean, I think streaming is definitely the dominant way to consume music now. I hate even saying that, consume music as if it's mm -hmm. a product, but that's kind of where we're at nowadays. Uh, but yes, I think streaming is here to stay and that's just how it is. Um, for me, I know that streaming is a big part of my um, how people listen to my music, but it's nice to see that actually both vinyl and CD still sells. So that means that there's still people that like the physical formats. And I think vinyl especially is selling more Mm -hmm. more and more it seems like because obviously it's a format that has this like legendary status for younger people that didn't grow up with it perhaps uh, with the sound quality being different the kind of um, different touch that it gives but also the fact that for us that are really into visuals it gives a, a visual art piece that you can hang on your wall you can uh, display it with the music so yeah I think uh, vinyl is uh, definitely selling really well for me um, which is great. Please keep buying my vinyls. <laughs> <laughs> but, but everybody, what is your favorite uh, format to listen to music to, or your favorite way of listening to music? I actually really like vinyls. I think they're cool. Uh, but I also do streaming. I have to say, yeah. 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 Finn, obviously vinyl. Well, it's it's different. I I I stream a lot uh, in my you know day to day activities. But um, if if you want to digest an album uh, and do it properly, I think you should play it on vinyl because you know it's it's the ritual. You have it in your hands. You can put it on the vinyl, and you have to listen to the whole thing. You can't skip anything. Uh, so you know, playing side A and side B, it's a, it's a good experience, and you know, it makes you you know you have to listen to the whole thing. It's not uh, mm -hmm. something you skip. If you mm -hmm. don't like the first 10 seconds on a song, you don't, you don't, you don't skip it. You accept listening to it. So, uh, and, and the sound experience is different. So you have to learn to appreciate and you know, be patient and listening to the whole thing. So I, I love to listen to an album on vinyl. Mm -hmm. Talk Jim. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I have to be unpolitical correct and say long haul drives Spotify in the car yep mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah it's like that's the moment when you uh, can really focus because mm -hmm. uh, in the daily life there's ki uh, kids around there's everybody uh, yabbing around and uh, so sitting in a car just driving and listening to music is my favorite way of experiences experiencing experience <laughs> <in> music. <laughs> <laughs> but you don't Sorry. have a CD player in the car? <laughs> no. Okay. I same. have a CD player in my car, I do, that I have mixed CDs on. But what I do like though, 
the, the, the thing with, uh, I mean, streaming, of course, sucks in so many ways, but it's still, I still exchange playlists with my friends, like we made mixtapes before, you know, when we were young. And tapes, they really, th my tapes from the 80s, I can't play them because they really do not keep very well, you mm -hmm. know, uh, unfortunately. So, so the streaming thing is good for, for the mixing and, and giving each other music. Mm -hmm. But I can, I can, while streaming, I can get, like sometimes when I go into, I can panic when I go into a big record store. Like if I'm in, in the States and I go into an Amoeba, <laughs> I just, go to like the Pink Floyd section for some reason. Because I used, I used to, yeah, yeah, I'll meet Eva <laughs> there. Because you know, I go to the stuff that I recognize because mm -hmm. I just get stressed. And I think Spotify is the same way for me because I always put on the same mm -hmm. things because it's just too much. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But when I'm home and I'm on my own and also no kids, um, I put on vinyls. Yeah, kids <laughs> suck. <laughs> they suck. <laughs> offense. Yes, offense, offense taken, offense given. And Eva? I have to say cassette. <laughs> of course you do. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> to go against the stream. Yes. Yeah, that and also, because I, I think my dearest memory is when, you know, because pff, in the early 90s, there was all, the, all these, there were these, all these advanced tapes flowing. Mm -hmm. And remember <laughs> one particularly <laughs> silly instance, uh, Euronymous, he knew how obsessed we were with the mysterious from Satanas, the advanced tapes. Mm -hmm. And after Attila added his vocals, he lent us the tape for four hours. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so that's me and Gutlin and his uh, enormously stupid bl little blue Opel cart driving on the ring road around Oslo, <laughs> 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 listening to that and fucking, you know, that. That defined everything that happened afterwards. Uh, there was a little bit of boop yeah. at the beginning of the cassette, and sometimes you could hear, oh no, it's probably not him going <laughs> on his guitar. It's probably the cassette tape getting a little bit <laughs> exhausted. <laughs> but just those, yeah. I still have a cassette player and, and listening to it. I tried buying one from Klaus Olson, don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> Because, no offense, <laughs> it sucks. <laughs> For those who don't know, Klaus Olsen is Swedish. Yes. Mm. yes, it's a big store. So get a proper cassette player. Uh, and <laughs> there's just something about it. It's just so melted together. And also, I, w I guess it was the moment when I realized, because since we, we started a band when I was uh, 12, and then it's kind of hard to differentiate, like, uh, what the fuck happened? Was there a youth there? Was there a grown-up period? Whatever. But when my kids, when I showed them a tape, and they're like, what's that, Dad? <laughs> <laughs> and I could go on Wikipedia and show, this is a cassette. <laughs> <laughs> it's like a streaming thing put into a plastic <laughs> square. <laughs> and they were all impressed. <laughs> Actually, the only time I've been in a car crash involved a tape player in the car. Because <laughs> right. I was actually driving with two friends home from a gig with Metallica, the first uh, the, the tour they did like in December of 92. I'd had my driver's license for one month. And they played, like, I think, Enter Sandman, like the only thing from the Black Album, I think. I was on the, my way home and I was fiddling because the tape was like, you know, like that. It was actually a Prince tape. That's uh, because I also very much love Prince. Probably Satan interfering. Yes, probably, maybe, <laughs> but I still love Prince. And I drove straight into another car because of the tape player. And we <laughs> talked about this last week, and I think, with uh, when Mayhem was recording the Mysteries at Gegal, he had a Euromus, his car, was broken into, and they stole everything except the Mayhem tapes. <laughs> 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 Which pissed him off so much. <laughs> <laughs> But regarding tapes, I, I uh, interviewed Pitten for the Emperor tape box set, and I asked him, uh, you know, about his opinions about, you know, having tapes back on the market. And he, you know, is this a stupid idea, or do you, have, you know, do you approve? And he said, you know, it's it's, it's kind of funny, but he said, but he said that 
Some tapes have a different uh, sound palette, you know, like how you experience the sound. So, so he, he said that he still has certain albums that he prefer to play on tape. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I can totally relate. And but, you know, for Ivar and myself, uh, having gro growing up is playing tapes, it's kind of a you know, fountain of youth, having, you know, mm -hmm. doing the same, y you know, having the good experiences, being, and being, being able to play tapes again. It's, it's a good you know, reminder of the experiences we had l a long time ago. Mm -hmm. So it's also about nostalgia, o obviously. But but you are something like a box set consultant, I would say. You you help people out when they put together vinyl box sets and stuff. And what do you think? Uh, how long is this posit uh, positive development of vinyl say is going on? And will there still be any physical products, maybe like 20 years from now? Well, I guess the vinyls and the tapes will uh, continue being produced as long as we live. But maybe not when there's guys, you know, 20, 30 years younger than we are. Don't they might not have the same nostalgic, mm -hmm. you know, material, you know, associations because I think when I look at my kids, they don't have the same material associations to, to items like mm -hmm. we had. Because yeah. when we were growing up, we, we had tapes and we had vinyls and T-shirts and, you know, it was different. Now th they don't relate to the items like we did. So I think it, it will be important as long as we live. And, uh, and if you look at, you know, if you look at, you know, regarding collect collecting stuff like I do, if you look at, you know, Elvis or Beatles, you know, nobody's collecting that now. So, so what we are now, you know, focusing on it's going to be this it's going to be it's going to disappear you know with us our generation i guess mm -hmm. yeah. it's going to die off with us yes so um, it is. so talking about the future of metal i wondered if uh, an event like this today isn't somehow the future of metal <laughs> because i think no none of us would have thought uh, years ago that something like that uh, would ever be happening uh, like having uh, the a metal inv event in, a, in an embassy. Uh, Ika, what would you say, how has the cultural reception of metal as an art, art form developed? I think the first thing, the first time at least for the Swedish extreme scene happened in 2002 when the first cross-pollination happened when Entombed mm -hmm. played at the Swedish Royal Opera. Uh, together with a ballet, it was a part of like a ballet. Um, yes, uh, it's actually, I'm actually looking at all those tapes next week because we might do a documentary about that. Um, and and uh, it was called Unreal Estate and it was like four, pi they were part of like four, there were four different pieces, they were one part and you could only buy one ticket for the whole thing. So there were, you know, Hell's Angels in the audience next to blue-haired ballet ladies. <laughs> and it was, it was a bit of like, I wouldn't say a scandal, but it was like a really weird thing that, that many were terrified of. Because why are they there? And it was so loud and it was so grubby and how, you know? S uh, very sexy to me, <laughs> very <laughs> sexy. But, uh, but in a good way. <laughs> but, uh, but so I think, that was like the first, at least for the Swedish scene, that that happened. And but then it didn't really happen. I mean, things are moving into the cultural institutions very slowly, faster these last couple of years. But in I mean, it's it's taken a long time. It's an old mm -hmm. genre that mm -hmm. has, of course, people are bound to see. You know, when it started in the late eighties, nineties. Um, it's all noise, of course, to everyone. And then people start to learn to listen to it. People start to hear, and then I, by people I mean people outside of the metal scene. They, s they start to hear the, the, w the quality of the work and the difference and, and how it develops and what it all entails. And of course, you're bound to see, you know, the artistic qualities in it and why it's interesting. And also, of course, because of all of the interest I mean, it's because it has had such an enormous impact. It's just like in the recent years that hip hop has become, at least in, s in Sweden, nagging at the end of uh, metal because it's been the biggest genre mm -hmm. commercially, mm -hmm. as I mm -hmm. said, um, like sales wise. 
So it should, I, s I would say it should be more. I mean, there's been this, uh, Satyricon has done an exhibition. That's like the, the last screen up there that, that you know began in the teenage room and it ends at the Munch Museum where Satyricon has curated uh, an exhibit and Dorley Stemning, Bad Vibes, an exhibition at the National Library in Oslo that was extremely well made. And uh, I mean, Finland, fin <laughs> Finland even, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Finland even markets its country, you know, by by the amount of metal bands. Even President Obama referenced that. And mm. then, I mean, it's something to be proud of. But I mean, the, the countries have have used that very differently, very differently. I wouldn't say Sweden really wears metal as something to be proud of. Do you think Norway does? Maybe it's be starting to be begin, but. I mean, uh, some of the same things happened in Norway in 1998 with the Grammys when Dimmer Borge was invited to play. Mm. Yeah. And they had uh, Trondheim to listen, wasn't it? Oh, yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. a, sym a symphonic orchestra mm -hmm. that uh, backed out in the last minute. Yeah. And, uh, and they sort of gave them s TV time. Yeah. But they had to, afterwards, they had this uh, very jolly Norwegian uh, artist, Venke Myhre, yeah. <laughs> to, co yeah, to come on uh -huh. and sort of tone it down and yeah. joke about it and yeah. sort of yeah. uh, r sort of ridicule it. Mm. Uh, but mm. it's getting you know, warmer. <laughs> <laughs> but, well, but it's a co just a couple of years ago, Mayhem uh, won the uh, honorary award mm -hmm. at the same Norwegian Grammy, you know. Uh, mm. so, so that's... A really high price to, to gain in Norway and yeah, but that's still a music thing you know mm -hmm. well it's about the heritage and I think you know mm -hmm. the NRK documentary Helvete had mm -hmm. a huge impact on you know making mm -hmm. the public understand their importance because it's a global phenomena and I've been you know saying to people that uh, when the history books are going to be written about Norwegian music in a couple of hundred years it's going to be a whole chapter about Norwegian black metal mm -hmm. yeah. I, I, it's going to be about mayhem and dark throne emperor and Bursum. you know it's mm. that's that's the you know the heritage from Norway it's not going to be about pop music yeah. so I, so it's going to be like this and then slaved sorry yeah, right. a bit about yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was mentioning yeah. aha Aha will, Aha will have three sentences. <laughs> <laughs> but Aha uh, was not mayhem. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, uh, but I can also add, for our part, uh, the festival, uh, a few years back, it would be unthinkable to stage a festival in Grigal, exactly. for, uh, for yeah. instance. And, mm -hmm. uh, and the way we've been welcomed there is incredible. And yeah. they are like, yeah, why? We, we wouldn't do a festival, but your guys, you, you guys are mm. okay, and your audience is just mm. amazing. So mm. please move the whole festival over to this venue, please. Yeah. Yes. So it's <laughs> like. I, uh, yes, I think uh, it's uh, speeding it up. It's speeding yeah. up a bit, I it's think. It's a I think major change of attitude yeah. towards it. But yeah. is that only a good step that it's taken more seriously in like sophisticated culture, or does that somehow take away the rebellious element that metal should have? I'm not sure that bands in their 50s are very rebellious anymore. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I don't think, I mean, I have full, I mean, a lot of people and a lot of friends, I can understand that people hate that this exists, mm -hmm. that, we do, that, I've done, that we've done this. Mm -hmm. I have friends who really hate it and mm -hmm. despise the fact. Um, mm -hmm. But I think, um, you know. Could you ask for one? Probably, <laughs> probably could. But I mean, uh, I mean, f it does. Bo both things has to exist. I don't think that it takes away from it. And if you want to be, you know, more rebellious or true or whatever, you can just say no. Yeah. To mm -hmm. I don't think it's a, a problem actually. Mm -hmm. no. I mean, we're all old farts, yep. except you. <laughs> so <laughs> it's up to the next generation to be rebellious, exactly. <laughs> or <laughs> the future of metal to be rebellious. Exactly, uh, and it's all fine. Yeah. I I love the fact that that still exists and that yeah. they hate us. Yeah. Perfect. <laughs> That's the way it's supposed to be. Let's call an album. Hate them. <laughs> hate <laughs> them. <laughs> Dark Throne already oh. did. <laughs> 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 okay, I think we should uh, come to an end and I have one more question to everybody of you. Um, who would you think uh, or which bands would you think have the potential to headline festivals in like 10 years from now? Do you have any ideas? 10 years? Yeah. But just give me 
know what's going on. Not really. Not really? No. Uh, enslaved? Enslaved? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. In 10 years, pretty much almost every band that plays today that's not 80 years old. I mean, <laughs> all the Norwegian and Mayhem will be playing in 10 years, of course. Then like let's say. What do you mean? 80. Yeah, yeah they'll be 80 by then, but, but they'll be playing. But <laughs> they are not going to be uh, headlining like oh, you meant the like really Vakken. big festivals. You meant yeah. like headlining like Vakken. Yeah. Ghost will be headlining Vakken. 10 years from now? Yeah. Do you think they will last that long? Yeah. I'm unsure. But it, yeah, really that's hard to say. I really hard to say I'm the wrong person because I love for Silva. I love the first albums, but um, but the by the but the audience they're getting and that they still have the yeah I think they might be. Gojira. Gojira, can mm -hmm. Yeah, they were um. healthy. <laughs> 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 but let's not kid ourselves. Rolling Stone still exists. Yes. Yeah. Uh. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I wouldn't be uh. surprised mm -hmm. actually. Well, I hope. Uh, at one day Gulve wakes up and decides yes. to play Dark Throne mm -hmm. again. Yes. And I hope uh, Snorre in uh, Thorns also decides, I know he's thinking about it, I hope also he decides to do Thorns at some point in time. So I would say Dark Throne and Thorns. Mm -hmm. mm. <sighs> yeah, I would say that um, I also think that all the bands that are around now will literally die on stage <laughs> before they stop playing. Yes. So I think <laughs> we will see Iron Maiden, I think we'll see Oh, Def Leppard, Def Leppard, yeah, sure. Uh, Deep Purple, uh, I don't know, but you know, yeah, definitely a lot of those bands will still be around. In terms of who will be able to replace them when they're actually gone, this is a really difficult question. Yeah. I'm not really yeah. sure. Like my thoughts also went to ghosts, but I also agree with Todd Game. Like, is this a thing that will last? I'm not yeah. sure. But we then we have a band like Sabaton, which we can't mention here because they mm -hmm. played in Crimea ten years ago, but. Uh, I mean, Sabaton is huge. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. They will def. I mean, if if, yeah, they will definitely be headlining. Or in bands 10 years. also like Rammstein that also like are Rammstein, just like yeah. Mm, but still, yeah. that's but they also are still they're having yeah. some problems with. Uh, yes, <laughs> I know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm aware. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I will also say bands like Gojira probably, mm -hmm. and I, I think they are Gojira also. Gojira would kind never of like do that. Yeah. No. Never. But, no. but in all, all seriousness, it's kind of a weird situation because. From the inception of rock and roll, we still have the originator Stones yeah. and everybody. Uh, mm -hmm. In reality, it's only Black Sabbath and a few others that are thrown in a towel. So we don't know anything about what the world is will be like mm. without mm -hmm. the originators. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Why everybody don't we is still make around. Really old cars anymore. Yeah. So, <laughs> ten years from now can be a really scary place. We don't know what it's going to be like at all. Or a super exciting place because yeah. when all they die off, there there might finally be place for. New ones a new because door it's closes uh, no, no, or yes. a door closes I mean a new one. We're going to die yeah. horribly. Yes. yes. With our boots on, I hope. Yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, I think that's a good closing. <laughs> <laughs> a very optimistic. We're going to die with our boots on. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, uh, thank you all. Thank you. Um, if you have any questions, um, oh. they can be answered now by these people. I think. One straight away. I was wondering which of the two would help the most. Mm. So with so much, um, so much great information from all of you guys up there, I'd really re like to know, what do you think um, is the most important quality of a metal band or metal fan? The most important quality, is it for me s maybe stubbornness? <laughs> Passion. Yes. <laughs> um, it's easy. I also like it when I really love a good show. Metal bands who really, really, really put on a good show are the best for me. I have to say, when a band, it's about believing in what they do. Uh, for me, one okay. Mention two, op, you know, on the opposite scale of maybe talent. Old Hellhammer tapes. It's like ah, they almost can't play. <laughs> but it's such a fucking the attitude of it. It's so good. The song mm -hmm. Messiah. Mm -hmm. It's all moving one fret at a time. 
and it's so brilliant. <laughs> I loved it in 91, I love it today. And then you listen to Meshuga, which uh, do a little bit more than just rocking on the track. <laughs> 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 but they really believe in what they're doing. It's theirs, mm. and that's why they're always miles ahead of, you know, every time Meshuga releases an album, you have a, there's a new scene founded of people trying to rip them off, and then there's five days, and then releasing something new, which is, whoo, way ahead. But it's the same thing, because they won't really believe in what they do, and they don't really care on what's happening on the other end. I just want to mention a uh, discussion at Helvete, uh, the infamous Mayhem shop in the early 90s, and everything was about, you know, oh, your demo is great, your demo is great. And then somebody had a uh, very troublesome question, like, uh, we, we heard that the, the new Dark Throne is going to sell a lot of albums. Is that gonna, is that gonna ruin it? <laughs> 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 that people buy the album? That it's commercial? <laughs> Everybody's like, mm hmm. <laughs> <laughs> thinking, thinking. Didn't have a bear then, of course. But then somebody concluded, no, it doesn't matter. Do what you do, and if people buy it, it becomes commercial, but that's not your fault. <laughs> then everybody went back to, yeah, cool. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. <laughs> and I think that's, you know, it doesn't matter if it sells a billion or 10 albums. If, if the band believes in what they're doing, that is great. And I think the same for the, for the metal fan. So you you're saying a pragmatic approach was okay? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I, l I wish I knew that sentence then. <laughs> Hey guys, what about a pragmatic approach? <laughs> 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 that would be <been> awesome. <laughs> I, um, hi, yeah, I, I, Ika. I, I, first of all, I want to thank you for this exhibition. It's I really enjoyed it a lot, um, and I appreciate it very much. Now, um, for me, heavy metal, I often describe it as a uh, like the home port, because I. I venture out to into pop music and jazz and classical music, but I keep coming back to this. So for me, in this discussion, I found very interesting this, I don't know, this keyword of being a very, uh, you know, uh, having to do with identity. Uh, you called it, um, uh, I forget the word now. Um, Community? You know, well, looking back, you know, in, into the past. Heritage, yeah, heritage. And I, I'm really curious, and I don't know who can answer this, maybe all of you, maybe one of you, but why is that? Why is it that uh, when I listened to your uh, concert earlier, uh, I, don't know why the, I don't know why it speaks to me. I had the same experience with Enslaved, a band I, haven't, I didn't even know a, a year and a half ago, but I discovered and it speaks to me, and I wonder why that is. Why is it... Uh, and it, it, it keeps coming back in these Nordic themes and metal themes, and it, I'm s just so curious. I wonder what your thoughts are. Thank you. Of course. Yeah, very small question, very easy to answer. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm guessing you're just one of us, and maybe you didn't know it from the beginning. <laughs> I don't know, I have the same feeling. I, have, I listened to loads of different music. Metal was the first thing I grew up, I, I, it started with Kiss for me. And uh, you know the, the the expensive tapes at the gas station at the Shell station in my suburb, when when Dad decided to just like, Ch -ch -ch, yes, you can have the Elder. I'm like, yes, <laughs> this is the best thing I've ever heard. Best Kiss album. It is the best Kiss Fantas album. Fantastic I, album. I love the Elder, but um, but I I don't know. It just it just resonated within me. And even though it I've. Oh, I, I listen to loads of different music, but I always come back to it too, and I always feel a community. And I, if I, it's a, it's a, it sounds stupid and silly, but to me it is a tribe because everyone I've met in working with, with throughout my life, but also in working with this, you become friends instantly. It's very easy. If you're a metalhead, you're just oh yes, okay. Well, then you know that you're kind of the core, uh, to the core, have s a lot of stuff in common that's really important, and I don't know why that is. Does any one of you? Do you agree? Yes. Yes, thank well, you. Isn't that kind of the beauty of art too, though, in any form, is that you don't need to know why. It just makes you feel. And that's all you need, actually, yeah. in the end. Yeah. 
It's hard to answer that question, but congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, yeah, I have a question for all of you. What were you, or which new up and coming artist or band or concert or record were you most excited about this year? Or are you excited about which is like laying ahead, like metal wise? I need to think someone else has to answer this first. Start on that side now. <laughs> <laughs> wow, the pressure is hard. <laughs> Yeah, well, uh, for me, actually, I just uh, just discovered an artist just a few weeks ago that got signed to my label, Seize the Mists, um, that I wasn't aware of before. That is a new band, actually. It was a solo project first, I think, but has become a band that's called Helga. Mm -hmm. um, really cool uh, Swedish uh, Swedish lady that makes music. That's very, very a mixture of all kinds of stuff, which is very cool. It's metal. It's folk. It's weird. It's great. So I would say Helga, she's releasing a new, or they are releasing a new record this year. So check that out. Well, I would say uh, for my part, it would be the guys from Trondheim, uh, the Nidaros environment, you know, Mare or Mare, as you would say. So they, those are the new guys uh, leading the pack. And I would also include Vemod uh, in cool. that uh, direction. We have a lot of the bands from that, you know, small group of people that, uh, you know, they had to put it on the on the shelf because of, you know, one of the main guys dying uh, some years ago. But uh, I would look into that uh, absolutely, L and also including Horde and Rife, uh, Mani, mm -hmm. um, a lot of good good bands there, Ritual Death. Um, and also, you know, the, the winner of the Grammys last year, uh, The Evil, is also a fantastic band. So I would say The Evil, uh, Mare, and uh, Vemod in Norwegian. Look it up. Uh, I think I have to go with a Polish band called Man Brian, uh, Man mm -hmm. uh, which is, uh, was not supposed to be a live act. They've done a few shows in... Um, their home country and they're playing the festival next year as the first foreign show for on their part i support that mm -hmm. um i think uh, am yes. i also oh asked? yes yes <laughs> indeed <laughs> uh, oh that's yes uh, that's a very nostalgic thing but i'm really looking forward to the new merciful fate record that is announced yeah. uh, like two since two years or three years and i hope that someday it will mi miraculously uh, <laughs> appear. Um, I mean, the song they played yeah, on the tour that I saw at Beyond the Gates in Bergen last year, which was like one of the best concerts I've ever seen in my life. Mm -hmm. That True song story. was, what? True story. Yes, that True song yeah. was very promising. Yeah, I, I very I'm, promising. I'm really looking forward to it. And then I saw that the Norwegian band Sake is, really, uh, is uh, recording a new record again, and I'm a big fan. So uh, I hope this will uh, be released soon. And uh, coming to new bands who do classic metal, newer bands, not new, but newer, uh, the new Sorcerer record from Sweden is also a record yeah. I'm really looking forward to. I think there is no better band doing like traditional metal around uh, on earth these days than uh, Sorcerer. Mm. So I'm also from the same kind of scene in Sweden, the band that played the opening, Eternal Evil. Very young, very good, super, super thrash in the vein of Creator and all the good <laughs> German <laughs> trash bands. They're so good. I'm looking to see what's going to happen there. And also this summer, it came to my attention that, uh, I, that there's this um, female black metal band called Matriarchatum. They released this like really crushing album uh, that's, <laughs> that's like in a very funny way, very fem feminist with songs like Don't Fuck Me Jesus <laughs> and stuff <laughs> like that, which is like the best, <laughs> the funniest thing I've ever heard and it's really good too. So I'm wow. looking to see, yeah, don't fuck, have you ever heard anything that good? That's great. Mm. Yes, so I'm looking, I'm looking forward to see what they're going to, because I don't think they've played live yet and I'm really hoping that they will. But that's a good point, so no crime committed. Of course. <laughs> Let's hope they never play live. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah. Um, there's a bunch of new bands coming out of uh, Bergen. They're mostly prog bands, so I guess they're not that relevant here. Uh, speaking of classic bands, the new Marduk is really good. Mm -hmm. Speaking of wine and dine made Jesus. <laughs> yes, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, that's great. But uh, I think the most exciting moment of this year was the new Deathbell Omega on vinyl. Because we always, yeah, just bragging. I'm a recording artist, you know. So they always tell us, keep the uh, sides of the album at this length, right? Despel Omega this is, did this wonderful thing. The song just goes, and then it stops. <laughs> the vinyl is over. <laughs> I thought I was fucking great. <laughs> <laughs> Finally, somebody just said, fuck you to the label. <laughs> this song is 22 minutes if the album, you know, if a vinyl side is 21. That's your problem. <laughs> <laughs> About time. <laughs> so, yeah. And also, I think the way that they are now going from dissonance, chaos, into some kind of orderly chaos is, is, is very interesting. And That's it's a band. It's That's the same, it's the the same but, uh, you know, they removed some of the noise yes. or the complexity. Yeah. But they have never made one second wrong, in my opinion, throughout their whole catalogue. It's a wonderful <laughs> band. Yeah. Um, I was wondering, you were speaking a lot of the metal becoming a lot more mainstream or acknowledged by mainstream. You spoke of that it happens, but you do you have any idea why it is? Why do more people care about metal, especially extreme or metal forms? <laughs> Should I answer? <laughs> yes. I don't know. I think uh, the pe people that were young with extre uh, when extreme metal became a phenomenon is now older and sitting in key positions around mm -hmm. in the society, in the media, in the yeah, whatever, uh, and also. So it's more normal in a way, uh, but also people sort of realize that there's quality there. There's uh, an interesting artistic point to be made. And uh, so when people have learned to see behind all the fuss and all the, you know, smoke and whatever you want to call it, uh, there's a lot of artistic I inspired music and uh, art there. So, yeah, I don't know if... I think definitely it has to do with that. And also, um, I mean, us being in key positions, um, people our age um, not tiring of the music and still going to the festivals and bringing exactly. our kids to the festivals in a way that generations before us, you know, grew up. I mean, I think the people born people born in the 70s were the f are the first to have not like become adults in the traditional sense that our parents that were born in the 40s became, also people in the 60s a bit. So we're carrying the interest in music along with us and therefore also spreading it and also sitting in key positions. For example, I mean, of course it has an effect that, you know, the, the, the most well-known songwriter from Sweden, Max Martin, every time he's interviewed, he mentions his old metal band. And the major movie director, Jonas Åklund, used mm -hmm. to play for five seconds in Bathory, but mm -hmm. he still talks about Bathory. <laughs> But, you know, that also makes a lot of people understand Bathory. That makes a lot of people mm -hmm. say, oh, Jonas Åklund's important. He played in Bathory. Bathory in, are in this book. Hmm. Now Bathory is in, like, the Music Hall of Fame in Sweden, which was unthinkable. And it's still kind of unthinkable if you ever heard Bathory <laughs> outside of the metal. And so, of course, it, it, uh, it spreads and people become becomes <laughs> curious and also realizing maybe that it's going. You get used to it as well. You, you're hearing, yeah. it's the same with opera, you need to listen to extreme metal to, to, uh, to understand it and try to you know, hear the differences. But the most, yeah. the most important thing as Ivar is, is that Ivar and the guys in the early 90s made a remarkable music within a really short time frame. Mm -hmm. you know, so, so the music that they, these guys made from 1991 to 1995 is, you know, is, is, is world class. It's, it's never been done before. So, so that's the most important reason, I guess, because it's y y you can't you can't copy it. It's it's uh, 
you know, they made history. That's the most important thing. And I think that also, you know, when uh, I saw an interview, uh, when, when Sigur uh, Satyr uh, was interviewed in Helvete, he was kind of asked about <coughs> his uh, take on the whole situation about, you know, all the events that happened in the early 90s and how that, uh, you know, impact impacted the, the whole environment. And he said, that we have to prove, we have to prove ourselves double, you know, this we have to prove that we had, you know, music. It was not only about the uh, events that happened. So they had to really, you know, uh, prove uh, what they did uh, more uh, because of all the skepticism in the uh, international media. So, so the quality of the music I is, is why, uh, in my opinion. I just have to add a little millennial touch to this here. Uh, <laughs> basically, <laughs> <laughs> sorry, that was not meant as offense. It came out wrong. Okay, <laughs> so <laughs> of course the quality of music, no doubts, and the genre isn't like you know it's not 60 years old, so it's it's still. I mean, it's it's been around for a while, but I think it's a bit the same with rock and roll too. It took a little while before it really became massive. Uh, I also personally think there is an environmental thing with this as well, and the fact that our world is a really <laughs> fucked up place. Let's be honest. So people might turn to this kind of music because it can uh, it can express and communicate emotions that are a little bit deeper and beyond what maybe mainstream music can express that aligns more with how society feels these days. So I think that also is a contributing factor, mm. personally. Definitely. Mm. Yeah, I just want to remind that at some point it was a bit of uh, culture wars not to be confused with Alec Jones and those crazies today, but <laughs> uh, I was ho hospitalized, I got beat up uh, for being a black metal guy. Uh, our singer, he had to quit his working place because he was vandalized every day by people putting on, uh, you know, things on his locker and, and things like that. It was a really host hostile environment. They were like fucking Satanists and Bergen Stiedene. Uh, our regional newspaper in Norway, they had a piece one morning that said that uh, were, uh, the Satanists were stocking up automatic weapons and bombs in the bunkers, Germans, no offense, <laughs> outside Bergen, and that we were planning to do a satanic revolution. <laughs> <laughs> Can you imagine the blue-haired old ladies? They, all, they puked from being so afraid. And uh, this is the same time as uh, Bursum guy was doing his anonymous interviews and all that. So it was dangerous to go out on the town. Mm. For us in Haugesund on the, on the southwest of Norway in the Bible Belt, it was, it was a real danger. You had to fight your way through sometimes. And I have to say, we were what we were saying is that you know religion is making people blind to basic human values, and it needs to be fought. It's an actual war. And then you see 25 year, years later, don't mind about who's on television, but you see that people are now saying that they don't want to speak about being a personal Christian anymore. And I have to say, yes. <laughs> It's not about being, it's anything wrong with being a Christian, but it needs to be removed from the public space. There's a political, not even a political, but a personal, psychological issue that we actually meant something with back in those days and still mean. And it's all about getting into the picture. You can't change the picture from outside the frame. You have to get in there. And when people say, like, why do they accept it more now? Like, wait, society became more fucking crazy. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't become soft. We didn't become softer. Mm. There is an actual struggle. There's a struggle still to be. Struggle fought. is real. <laughs> <laughs> it's all not. It's all, it's not all men play on ten, even though that's a fucking cool thing. But. Uh, you know, black metal, if it wasn't that, that would still be the, the slogan. Oops. <laughs> kind of killed the vibe. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> okay, any more questions? <laughs> Otherwise, you can now enjoy the last 20 minutes of this exhibition after it's going to put to rest. <laughs>